Hey, hello, my name is Maggie Miller. I'm a fifth year PhD student at Princeton. I am defending my thesis in five days as of recording this, so maybe that will be over by the time you watch this. And I'm happy to give a talk about not theory, although I'm actually talking about links, sorry about that. And I'm talking from the perspective of someone who's interested in knots and links as they relate to the topology of three manifolds rather than maybe some kind of algebraic structure associated to a knot. Uh, okay, so the title of my talk is Dane Surgery on Links versus the Thurston Norm. The first object, the fundamental object that I need to tell you about is the Thurston Norm, which is really an invariant of three manifold in general, but uh, we'll see that it can be used in very interesting ways to study knots or links. So, okay, what is the Thurston Norm? So, definition. Also, I wrote my website because I have actual real notes about this. Uh, that's generous. I have longer notes about this on my website. So, Definition due to Thurston uh, in the early 1980s is that the Thurston norm is a pseudo norm defined on the relative second homology of the three manifolds. So here M is a compact, connected, oriented three manifold, potentially with non empty boundaries. So I wrote rel boundary. Uh, Probably we're thinking about your reducible three manifolds, but it doesn't have to be irreducible for this definition to make sense. Okay, and so real homology co coefficients are a little bit like difficult to work with geometrically, but integral homology is very simple to work with because an integral homology class in this dimension can be represented by a surface smoothly embedded into my three manifold. So uh, if alpha is integral, let me just recall that uh, alpha is represented by some surface that's not like that. Okay, so the norm uh, of alpha is really going to encode almost the minimum genus of a surface representing alpha, like a classic minimum genus problem, except we have to be a little bit careful. This is a manifold with boundary. So I would say that a surface with more boundary components is more complicated than one with fewer. So instead of just genus, we're going to use the Euler characteristic. And I also want to rule out some other trivial things. So really, what I'll say is that the positive Euler characteristic of a surface uh, is going to be the max of zero in the negative Euler characteristic. So what do I mean by this? It's basically the magnitude of the Euler characteristic, except if S happens to be a disk or a two sphere, then I still want to say that that's norm zero. I don't want to count that as like norm one or two, because then that would be more norm than the torus, and that doesn't make sense. We're obviously less complicated than tori. Okay, and then that's for connected surfaces. So in, in general, it's just going to be the sum of the, the positive or the characteristics of all of the Union. So that's exactly what you would expect, right? Okay, so this is going to give us our definition for integral classes. X of alpha is just going to be the minimum characteristic of S when um, alpha. Sorry also that my screen is bouncing. My iPad's not working and my phone is not working. So I'm recording this on my laptop. I'm also writing on my laptop. Okay. Um, so, this is integral. But then once we've defined a function on integral homology classes, we can extend to rational homology classes linearly, and then extend to real homology classes through approximation. So we've actually just defined a function on just all of real homology. Um, and so part of the work is actually making sure that that makes sense. Like, did you actually just give a well-defined function and Thurston proved that the answer was yes? And then he, he understood some other basic properties of this as a, a norm or pseudo norm. Well, he proved that it is a pseudo norm. There's a triangle inequality. Uh, that's not too hard to show. When it is non degenerate, the Thurston norm unit ball is a convex polyhedron symmetric about the origin, it's like through reflection in the origin. Uh, he even understood like what are the possible slopes of the boundary faces and some other like more subtle questions about it. Uh, but for us, let's just say that this is a pseudo norm. Of course, a three manifold. Of course, a three manifold can have a central tori floating around in it, or two spheres, um, if it's a, a if it's a reducible manifold, etc. So in that case, the norm of that class would be zero, 
uh, if you have something like torus that's non-trivial homology, and that means it can't possibly be a norm. So, ooh, X is. And if my three manifold does not contain a sphere, torus, disc, or annulus, just a surface of positive zero Euler characteristic, which is not normal. So uh, that wasn't about not for links at all. But if you are a three manifold topologist who is interested in knots and links, then maybe some of your favorite three manifolds are the complements of knots and links, which have been used for a long time to study knots and links that are three. So for example, let's suppose that we're interested in knots, because I think that probably we all are. Let's say that K is a knot. And the most natural manifold that we would think to study, given this knot, really knots are oriented, is its complement. We could study the Thurston norm on the second homology. Okay. Well, the problem with this is that K is a knot in S3, we have Alexander duality. The second homology here is just going to be. Uh, one generator, R, um, and in fact, the like positive one generator is going to be the homology class of a cipher surface for K. Right, so I have a surface oriented by the knot. Um, in this picture, it looks like a genus one, one's punctured, whatever. So we actually conclude that let's call the surface S. That's of this class. Well, if, if I could find a disk in that class, meaning that k is the unknot, then the norm would be zero. So zero if k is the unknot. And otherwise, I mean, all of the surfaces in the homology class are uh, uh, like surfaces with one boundary. Genus is at least the genus of the knot. I mean, they're just separate surfaces. So it's just 2g of k minus 1. Uh, K is non-trivial. Okay, so that's a perfectly good invariant. This is just recovering the cipher 3 genus, am I not? So I don't really need the first norm language to discuss it. It doesn't really seem like it's bringing anything new to the table. But on the other hand, let's say that I'm interested in links. So uh, maybe it's like a smaller subset of you, but hopefully a lot of us are interested in links too. Let's say two components, L is K1. So, um, what is our favorite two component link? Maybe it's like the uh, whitehead link. It's probably the whitehead link. Okay, so since this, um, and then maybe this is K1, and this one's K2. Okay, so if I have an N component link, then the second homology of its complement, H2 of L, is now going to have N generators. So in this picture, this is R2. So I'm going to encode the norm, so I can draw the unit ball of the norm as a subset of, of R2, which I'm just telling you, if this is not a generator, it's going to be a convex polyhedron, symmetric group reflection in the origin. Okay. So, well, what are two generators of those R2? They're homology classes of punctured cipher surfaces for my two knot components. So K1 bounds this surface properly embedded into the complement. It's a twice punctured disk. It has Euler characteristic minus one. And I, the parity of any surface with this boundary is determined by its boundary. And I can't hope to find a surface of Euler characteristic positive one because it would be a disk and then K1 and K2 would be unlinked, but they aren't unlinked. So in fact, the surface S1 is norm minimizing, by which I mean it achieves the actual norm of its homology class. So S1, if I draw that as a homology class here, is norm one and it'll be on the boundary of my unit ball. By symmetry of this two component link, uh, this, this link has a symmetry where I can exchange K1 and K2. The same is true of a cipher surface uh, for K2. 
picture. I can see one. Um, I'm actually not going to draw a twice punctured disc. I'll draw something else with normal end. Where's this red? Uh, this annulus appears to link to K1 and then attach another twisted band on top. And that's a genus one surface with one boundary that also has a like characteristic minus one. So the minimum surface, the norm minimizing surface is not unique in general. Okay, but whatever. So these two points are in the boundary of my unit ball. My symmetry, so are these two points, negative S2, negative S1. Okay, but what about like linear combinations of S1 and S2? So let's just try to understand S1 plus S2, like just one of each. Okay, so I'll do that in green. So here's S1 plus S2. I guess I'm going to bracket like that. So in my picture, in my link, I'm going to try to draw a surface where the boundary is um, the sum of those two previous boundaries. In particular, it'll go around a longitude of each knot once and some number of meridians, which I could compute from the linking number here actually is zero. Okay, so it's easy for me to draw a surface with a boundary. So if I do the link. So that's four disks glued together by four bands. Another disk that I can glue on top. This is a genus one surface with two boundary components. It has Euler characteristic minus two. Um, I can't find a surface with Euler characteristic zero with this boundary and this component because uh, that would be an annulus. So I'm just claiming that there isn't an annulus co-bounded between these two, these two knots. We understand what two component lengths have annuli in their complements and it's cables, I guess, or whatever. Um, so in fact, this actually has norm two. So one half of it is in the boundary of my unit ball. Okay, so what I conclude is that this whole line set by convexity is in the boundary of my unit ball, and so is this whole line segment. Okay, and I could repeat the whole procedure for S1 minus S2. I'll just tell you that by symmetry, again, it turns out that that, that homology class has norm two. And so this whole line segment and this whole line segment are in the boundary of my unit ball. I shade this in. This is the unit ball. So what have we done? We've just solved the minimum genus problem for a link, a two component link, where unlike knots, where I should have one cipher, I have one homology class that is preferred in second homology. I have the positive unit generator, okay? Here, I have a whole integers worth of homology classes uh, that bound, like primitive homology classes that bound surfaces. Like around the boundary of this unit ball, I see a circle, <laughs> or just say like the unit circle on this R2. If I take the primitive surface, the primitive homology class that's a multiple of each one, I'll get a different surface properly embedded into the, into the complement of this link, okay? Um, there's no inherent reason that I would prefer like a separate surface for K1 over K2. And you might even like this green surface better because it's sort of more like a separate surface for my link. Um, so if we want to talk about like the minimum genus of a link, that doesn't really, I mean, if we orient the link, then like, yeah, it has separate surfaces, we could study those. But if we're interested in sort of like more topology, like the complement of the link has many more interesting embedded, properly embedded surfaces, okay? So we've encoded for every surface homology class in the complement of this link, what is the, the minimum norm, which is basically the same as genus, but minimum norm of a surface representing that class. Okay, so why do we care about first and norm? I'll tell you a theorem about knots. So here's a theorem, very well known, the property R conjecture. So no longer conjecture, it's a theorem. It's proved by DFY in the 1980s. He wrote a series of papers called Foliations and Topology Three Manifolds, parts one, two, and three. This is in part three. So he proved that if A uh, is a knot in S3, then if K is non-trivial, neurosurgery on K is never as long as this two. Yeah, I guess the word then. Okay, 
so um, this notation, I'm not familiar with. This means that I'm doing Dane surgery, and in particular, I'm doing zero framed Dane surgery. That's a zero, not like a weird Q. Okay, so recall that Dane surgery means that I delete from S3 uh, a whole tubular neighborhood of my not K, that's a, a tessellate torus. I'm gonna glue in a new solid torus. And the zero frame refers to the fact that I have to tell you what is the gluing move. And in particular, zero frame means that I'm gonna delete a whole tubular neighborhood of my knot, re-glue in a solid torus exactly so that the boundary of a ciphered surface of my knot bounds a disc in that solid torus. Which means that this capped off surface actually gives me a non-trivial element of second homology. Uh, it's, it, it represents a non-trivial element of the second homology. And in general, when I do zero surgery, I will get uh, an integer homology uh, epsilon concept, no matter what my knot is. So with that in mind, it makes sense to ask, do we get actual S1 presses too, or just like some weird homology S1 presses too? And the answer is you never get S1 presses too, unless you do surgery on the unknot, and then you do. Okay, so this is an open question for a really long time. Uh, and the way that Dave proved this, so here's another theorem, is that he proved that if I have a surface, if it's S, is a surface properly embedded into my not constant, um, which is norm minimizing, which I have not really defined. In particular, I mean that its positive Euler characteristic is the norm of its homology class. If the if the manifold, if the not complement has non-degenerate norm, then that's just like all I mean. And in general, if I have a three manifold with non-degenerate norm, that's just all I mean by norm minimizing. If the norm is degenerate, I have to be like a little bit more careful. If I have a two sphere in the homology class, then a torus should not be norm minimizing, even though they both have norm zero. Um, so I'll just say like incompressible. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. And uh, just throw out some other things. And I'll just say nothing. <laughs> In particular, incompressible. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, then, well, as I mentioned before, when we do zero surgery on my knot, I can actually cap off that surface and get a closed surface, S10, sitting inside of S30. Okay. It's also a common It's not obvious that just because S is more minimizing the complement of my knot, that it'll continue to be uh, after surgery. Um, but once you know this, this basically proves the property R theorem. Because the point is that, well, if I have a knot which is non-trivial, then its cypher surface, uh, minimum cypher surface, is positive genus. And when I do zero surgery and cap it off, it'll, it'll be the same genus. So I get this positive genus surface inside of my zero surgery. Uh, and this theorem says that that's norm minimizing. But the generator of S1 cross S2 is an S2, it's point cross S2. Uh, so it has norm zero. Um, so this positive genus surface could not be norm minimizing. Uh, and this is how you prove the property of our theorem. Okay, so what is the analogous statement for limits? So I'll tell you my theorem and we'll talk about I guess all the things that I'm about to say. <laughs> so first I'll just talk about two component links. So let's say if L Two component link sitting inside of S3. Um, I'm going to say non zero linking number. I could rephrase this in a way that included zero linking number, but it's just silly, so let's ignore that. Oh, oops, the opposite of that. <laughs> if linking number is non zero, and also the norm of S3 minus L is non degenerate. I'm trying to write something that is analogous to the previous theorem, uh, the property R theorem. So asking for the norm to be non-degenerate is the analog of asking for a knot to be non-trivial. When we say a knot is non-trivial, I mean it doesn't bound a disk. Well, now here I have this link of like I can't find a disk or an annulus. Okay. Um, so that's non-degenerate. 
then the second homology, as we talked about before, of its complement um, is rank two. There's an integer's worth of surfaces, uh, homology classes of surfaces that we could be interested in. But there exist only finitely many. So there exists a finite set of exception inside of H2 of um, this. Uh, yeah, I guess it doesn't really matter if I write R or D here because I'm talking about surfaces, so whatever. Um, so if S is more minimizing and it's not an E. So what I mean by this, um, hat S refers to a closed surface that I would get in the, the Dane surgery of my link on uh, the boundary slopes of S. So a hat is contained in the three manifold. I would write S3 boundary of S, of L, which just means that uh, on each component of L, because I assumed that they have non-zero linking numbers, um, I have the surface S and it meets both of those two components. And so it's actually going to uh, meet them both in like maybe different slopes. So I'm going to do Dane's surgery according to those slopes exactly so that I can cap off S with disks in the resulting closed manifold. Uh, this is again a um, homology S1 cross S2. Okay, um, I guess that's easy to check. And I'm just claiming that that surface continues to be norm-minimizing in a surgery, analogously to the previous theorem. Okay, so um, this finite exception set is weird because we didn't say anything about that before. Uh, that wouldn't really make sense in this theorem. We can't have a finite set of exceptions when there's only one generator. Okay, but more than that, it's just important because otherwise it wouldn't be true. So what is our favorite two component link? Uh, I lied before. I think I said that it was the whitehead link. It's not. Um, definitely this one. So here's a two component link. Let's see if I can draw it here so you can see the theorem still. I am going to mess up these linking numbers. No, I'm not. Yeah, that went pretty well. So this is a two component link. Uh, it, uh, if I orient it, it has linking number one or minus one. Okay, um, so particularly not zero. Uh, the norm on its complement isn't degenerate. Uh, it's actually not that hard to just like check that or prove that. But also, uh, I guess I should mention that, oh, I forgot to say this, but the, uh, the, the Thurston norm, we, we understand a lot about how it relates to some other invariants. Mick Mullen showed that the multivariable Alexander polynomial detects the Thurston norm for links, almost all links through nine crossing. There's like one to four exceptions. In particular, like you can read off the, the Thurston norm unit ball of this link from its Ale multivariable Alexander polynomial. We see that it's not degenerate. Um, and, and even after that, like 10 years after that, 2008, Ojbeth and Zabo showed that the link floor homology of a link detects the Thurston norm of its complement. And there's a particularly nice formulation when the link is alternating. Um, yeah, but anyway, like this is just an easy example. So you could just do it. So here is a surface, which is norm minimizing in its homology class. I'm gonna first draw a three punctured disc. It looks like just a punctured cipher surface for like this left not component. I'm not shading. Um, but then I'm going to tube these two boundaries together. Okay, so this is a punctured, a twice punctured torus. This is a torus of two boundary components. Um, so it has a uh, Euler characteristic uh, two. Okay, it's actually norm minimizing because uh, I can't find an Euler characteristic zero surface because then there'd be an annulus and I just just claiming that there's not an annulus because then this would be like something trivial, but it's not. 
But let's suppose that I do surgery on this two component link according to the boundary slopes of, uh, of this surface. Well, it meets the left component in a longitude, zero framed, and the right component in a meridian. So if I do, call this S, if I do zero surgery, um, not zero surgery, sorry, if I do boundary of S surgery uh, on L, then in fact, we can just write down what it is. I'll do zero surgery here and infinity surgery on here. Well, I just ignore the component that I'm doing infinity surgery on. I'm left with an unknot that I'm doing zero surgery on, and I get that small grosses too. Okay. Um, but my surface S is genus one, it's a torus. So when I cap it off, I get this torus inside of S1 process too. It's not norm minimizing anymore. Uh, so uh, this is sort of like the bad case. Here we have to conclude that S is actually in E. This finite exception set is non-trivial and very important. Okay. Um, but the theorem is just that there, like, there's only finitely many like ways that this can happen. Like most of the time when you do surface frame surgery it'll actually be something non-trivial okay and then I, I have some more examples i have at least one more example on my website or in the paper that i read about this that shows some like different non-trivial examples of this happening like um where can the exceptional slopes by like the 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 homology classes that are in E, like sort of where can they be in relation to the unit ball are they at vertices are they at midpoints of edges blah 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 I don't exactly know, but they can be both of those things. Okay, so um, I'll give you a more general statement. First, I, I should say something about how this works. So what is the point? Like, how do we understand the Thurston norm? Well, theorem, uh, this is in Thurston's original paper. So if I have a surface S, uh, if S is the leaf, a leaf of a top foliation, S is norm minimizing. So uh, a foliation of a three manifold, decomposition of my three manifold into uh, surfaces, where locally at any point in my three manifold, I see this picture of like R3 filled up by a bunch of horizontal R2s. So they're like some like smooth family of surfaces. Um, they're also all oriented consistently, my manifolds oriented. This is a really a co-dimension one co-oriented foliation of my three manifold, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And a foliation is taught if there exists a, a, a one manifold properly embedded in M which meets every surface, which we call leaves. There's just a one manifold in M meeting every leaf and always doing so transverse. Okay, so um, this gives us a way to attempt to prove something is norm minimizing. If I have a surface and I can construct a foliation, a top foliation of my three manifold in which my surface is a leaf, then I'll be, I'll be happy. I'll know that the surface is norm minimizing. Okay, so uh, I guess here's like the classic example of what is a top foliation. For example, let's suppose that I have a, uh, a fiber bundle. So let's say a surface, maybe with boundary. Okay, I didn't really tell you what the foliation looks like at the boundary, but whatever. Um, I'm going to build a bundle of these over the circle such times i and then gluing the ends by some surface automorphism. Okay. And I get a natural foliation on this surface bundle where the leaves are just my horizontal uh, sigma cross print. So all my leaves are compact. Oh, sorry, I guess, please excuse me. I said leaf of a top foliation. I didn't mean, that's, that's 
very important. <laughs> Otherwise, like I, the only characteristic of non-compact surfaces is like complicated. <laughs> okay. So, um, in fact, this isn't just a foliation, it's a top foliation. Because if I take a point uh, inside of like sigma cross zero, it can just go straight down, sigma cross two pi. And when I glue the ends together, that'll get glued to something up here. Um, but now I can just sort of like go sideways, like sideways and just down a little bit to connect those two points. So, uh, I'll just get a closed circle. Um, like this. Okay. So what we conclude is that all of these horizontal sigma cross points, these compact leaves of top foliations are norm minimizing. So if I have any surface in the same homology class of the, the generator of a fiber bundle, um, then it has to have at least the norm of, of the generator. Okay, and in particular, if I'm talking about closed manifolds, norm is genus. And so I would know that like the minimum genus surface uh, in that homology class is the fiber. Okay, um, anyway, blah, blah, blah. So what they've proved, so theorem, by regarding property R is that if I have a surface specifically in a not complement in X3, which is very important, which is norm minimizing, then it is the leaf of a top foliation with a nice, like a nice property. So then For the boundary, uh, the intersection of F with the boundary of F3 minus the neighborhood K um, in only closed circles. Okay, so I mean, S3 minus the neighborhood of a knot is just some three manifold with torus boundary. So I, I have this foliation, a decomposition of my manifold into surfaces, but most of the surfaces could be non-compact and their boundaries could meet this boundary torus in some like gross just spiral forever. Um, so maybe I have the boundary of S, some collection of compact circles. But maybe I have some other leaf of spirals around this way, getting closer and closer to the boundary of us here, and then spirals around the other way, the other side. <laughs> Penn's too thick to draw that that well, but just some like gross non-compact curve. Um, but David's saying he can avoid that. Dave Gabay uh, can actually find a top foliation where the boundary, uh, whenever a surface meets this boundary torus, it does so in just a circle like this. The whole torus. Just S1 S1. Wow, that didn't go so well. Okay. So what's the point of this? That means that when I do Dane surgery on my knot, I can really cap off all of these closed compact circles. They bound discs now. And I'll turn my top foliation into a new top foliation on zero surgery. So it makes sense to write F cat, the new capped off top foliation on zero surgery, and S hat is a leaf. That is exactly why we know that S hat is still more minimizing. That's how I proved that, that first theorem that I talked about. Okay, um, and it's here it's very important that, that it's a not component we're talking about because we saw this example, this two component link, where doing some surface frame surgery caused a surface to stop being norm minimizing. So that means that even though this red surface is norm minimizing, it isn't the leaf of a top foliation with that boundary property. Any top foliation, including this as a leaf, must have some sort of like non-compact spiral thing happening at the boundary. And that means that when I do the surgery, I, I can't cap off something non-compact with a disc, so I don't get a capped off top foliation in the surgery. Okay, um, but he did prove and existence theorem just in general, I'm gonna like mess up the, what do you wanna assume about a three manifold? So I'm sorry about that, 
but um, uh, if s inside of a three manifold is not minimizing, and I, I'm not going to write it, I'm just going to say it, but if my three manifold, I want it to be like connected, uh, connected, irreducible, boundary irreducible, obviously oriented, com obviously compact, like just reasonable, you know. This is affiliation topology three manifold part two. Um, <laughs> so that's uh, then the leap a top without that nice boundary condition. Okay, so in that two component link example, we know there is really a top affiliation just with like terrible boundary. Okay, so what I actually prove um, um, is that in, in the case that I was talking about before, if L is a two component thing, non zero linking number, non degenerate norm, yeah. X of X of L, well, that thing, yeah. Degenerate. Um, then there exists a finite set E inside of two of boundary vector. So if um, S not an E. Uh, I guess really I, I should have said this before, but S is I wanna not allow multiples of S to be an E either. That'd be silly. Like S is primitive. More minimizing. Then in fact, uh, S is the base of a top foliation with this. Ooh, oops. Minimize my notes. Where'd they go? <laughs> then, in fact, this is the leaf uh, of a top foliation. There, uh, the boundary uh, only includes closed circles, closed compact circles. Uh, which means that we get, in fact, not only is S hat norm minimizing, it's norm minimizing because it is the leaf of a top foliation, which we obtain from capping off the top foliation of uh, of the link complement. Okay, so that's a little bit stronger. It's not clear, but in general, just because S hat is norm minimizing, you could hope for like this this whole global structure to extend in that way. Okay, so what is the idea of proving this? This is supposed to be like sort of a short talk. I actually have no idea how long I've been talking. I'm just like talking to myself. Um, <laughs> but I'm not going to try to like prove it. Um, the proof is not really like it's sort of geometric. It's not super, super difficult. Um, it's on my, it's on the archive. <laughs> it's on my website. <laughs> okay, but the idea is just to do surgery on product. The idea is to use various surgery operations that take by defined on foliations and laminations in this other paper he wrote called like something something suspensions of S1. <laughs> I don't remember. Uh, to start with the top foliation that he produces uh, given a norm minimizing surface in my link complement where I can't control the boundary data. I'm going to do this surgery operation to change the boundary data and hope that I can do it in such a way that the boundary becomes nice. Okay, so um, so I I have F with bad boundary, which includes S as a leaf. So here's my schematic for my two component link complement. It has two chloride boundary components um, corresponding to the two knots that I deleted. And I have this the surface S, okay, which is uh, <laughs> between them. So, okay, and 
I've already said that like I'm going to prove something with finitely many exceptions. So I'm happy to just not consider finitely many second homology classes. And so consider the first in norm on H2 of XL boundary. Uh, just R2. So I have this polyhedron, polygon, just like before, representing my unit ball. Unit ball. And within every face of that unit ball, the norm is just linear, right? Because it's just like a line. Um, so let's say this is some sort of S. I'm just like not going to allow S to be at a corner of the ball. I'll just throw those away. Um, I'm, I'm drawing a point here on the boundary, but really I just mean S is like a multiple of that homology class. It's uh, somewhere along this ray. So it's in, it's in the open cone. It's in the cone on the open face of the unit ball. Okay, but, but now that means that well, instead of just starting with a surface, I'm just going to construct another non-minimizing surface. Okay, so let's pretend that I, I even knew about this guy. Well, now S is a linear combination of the vertices on either side. So let's say this is surface like R, and this is surface C. These are their actual homology classes. And S is just some linear combination A R plus B C. Okay. So that means that if I understand norm minimizing surfaces representing R and T, I can construct a norm minimizing surface represented by S by just cutting and pasting A copies of R together with B copies of T. Okay, so if R is norm minimizing and T is norm minimizing and they intersect in some arc like this, these are all oriented surfaces. I can form a surface in the homology class. This is called R plus T by just deleting their intersections and gluing them back. It looks like I'm resolving and not crossing. The way that I get something that doesn't intersect with me. I did that resolution to be like consistent with their orientations. Okay. And, and if I were to take a different linear combination, I would just take A parallel copies of R and B parallel copies of T and just cut and paste them all together. Okay. But the nice thing about this cut and paste operation is that there's this dip. Sitting between these two sheets that I just made. Okay. Um, which has two boundary components. Uh, sorry, boundary. It's a disk. Its boundary is like four arcs. And it has two of those arcs on the surface and two of those arcs on the boundary tori. So here's this product disk. Now I'm going to try to draw this. I don't have that many colors in this app, which is kind of annoying. So here's my cut and paste. Maybe this is just R plus P. E. Draw a few boundaries. I don't know. Um, okay. And I have this cut and paste disk here, which looks like has one end that's like this at this boundary component and the other end, the other boundary component, and then these two long boundaries arcs that run along Okay, so this is my disk. And this actually gives us a lot of structure on my manifold, the, my link complement. So this gives us structure because 
I know exactly what my foliation looks like uh, near the product disk, right? Because near, that follows from, from work of Thurston and Rousserie, um, that looks like it's intersected in a straight horizontal line. So here's my disk. Of XL and boundary of XL. And here are leaves of these leaves just run on the disk. I get this nice local model. Looks like our standard model. So the surgery operation that I can do on these disks is that I'm just going to delete what here is a, a whole like three-dimensional disk times i because that's effectively what I've drawn. So this is like disk times i. Surgery. Delete. I'm going to re-glue it exactly. I'm going to shift that front, like disk cross one, up and down a little bit, according to just some automorphism of the interval. Shift um, according. A boundary. OK, so I'll draw a nicer picture of what that means. I had this three-dimensional plus I here, which was foliated by horizontal leaves. I cut it out and I re-glued it so that in the back it's exactly the same. But in the front, I pulled the leaves like up or down a lot to just totally shift everything. Okay. And this changes the intersection of my uh, foliation with the boundary. Because remember this face here, this is in the boundary of XL. And so is this face here that we can't see. So I've, I've taken some of those curves and like cut them and re-glued them. And I, I've just, maybe like I made new non-compact things, maybe I, I turned non-compact things into closed curves. Okay. So in the schematic, so the point is, well, I have these two boundary components. Well. I had this product disk running between them. And I'm going to do surgery on that product disk in such a way that I'll make new surgery to make my top foliation the distorus only in closed curves. Somehow, the existence of these disks, where I understand the foliation, and they connect the two toroid boundary components, lets me do surgery and fix one of the two toroid boundary components at the cost of, like, I have no idea what's going on with the other one. Okay. But if I have a lot of product disks running around, um, maybe I have many product disks. And there are a lot of different surgery choices that I have. I could surgery just one of them, or I could surgery like just the second one or just the third one, or I could surgery all three. And so I start to gain a little bit more control over like what will the result be on the other torus boundary component. Sorry, I'm being very vague. Uh, what we actually conclude is that if it fails to be norm minimizing, or yes, I think. Which I mean, if I can't make the boundary of 
like XL. Like the compact curves for surgery. Then the surface S uh, is minimum genus among all surfaces uh, in C. Whereby C, I, I, I'm meaning that, that cone that I referred to before. Um, this is my unit ball of X. And I had restricted my surface uh, homology class to not be a multiple of a corner of the unit ball. Uh, so something like this. Um, and so in fact, the surface of this homology class, this primitive homology class, has minimum genus among representatives for the, the homology class in um, anywhere in this open time. Linear com among all linear combinations of R and T, which is almost the same as saying that it's just R plus T so that has the smallest magnitude Euler characteristic. But there's something like weird, like maybe it just has, you know, uh, maybe one surface has a lot of boundary and that's why it has bigger norm. I don't know how to deal with that. Uh, okay, and so th the point here is that uh, as I take more and more copies of R and T and cut and paste them together, I get a product disk for every intersection. And the more copies of R there are, the more they will intersect T. And so um, I'll just get, I'll get bigger and bigger genus and I'll also get bigger and bigger uh, numbers of disks. And somehow like once that gets really big, I just have so much freedom that I can fix both of the boundaries at once and I'll do the surgery and everything will be more minimizing. I'll just cap off my top foliation. <laughs> okay. Being very vague, this is like a knot theory talk and I'm not talking about knot theory, I'm talking about three manifold topology. So if you're interested in this, you can like look at my paper. Um, but I'll tell you the, the general theorem. So general theorem, if I have a link, uh, let's say n component link, n is bigger than one, and maybe it's not even in three, maybe it's in our favorite uh, rational homology three sphere, y. Okay. Um, and I'll say that pairwise linking numbers is in a rational homology sphere, so that, that makes sense. Pairwise linking numbers are non zero. Um, and the, the, the norm, Thurston norm of its uh, complements is non determinant. Well, now the second homology of this complement has n generators. So there's a, an n minus one dimensional space of, of choices of surface homology classes that I could do surgery on. And again, it's gonna be that there's a co-dimension one subset of that where this exceptional behavior occurs. Uh, there exists n minus two dimensional complex of H2. So that, let's call this E. So if S is primitive, uh, S is non minimizing, and it's not an E, then we conclude that cat S from N, where this is contained in. Why, when I do Dean surgery, according to the boundary of S on L. Okay. Um, so this is very analogous to the previous theorem. Um, uh, yeah, I guess I'll just say something like, why is this a rational homology sphere? The point here is that like, the argument is always gonna go through fixing the boundary. Um, I'm gonna start off with a top foliation via this theorem of Dave Goodbye, where I, I have no control over the boundary data. I'm going to construct a new top foliation via surgery where the boundary is just compact closed circles. So, so really I could say something stronger than this. In, in this theorem, I, I get a top foliation that caps off to a top foliation in the surgery. Um, 
And so uh, I want to be able to control boundary data through surfaces intersecting at the boundary. And in particular, I want two surfaces that are in different homology classes to intersect in their boundaries. Uh, so assuming that L is a rational homology sphere and that my um, linking numbers are non-zero implies that uh, any two, yeah, in any two surfaces and different real homology classes have to have different boundary data. When I have more than two components, they could fail to intersect along some of the tori, um, but that behavior will just fall into this like exceptional subcomplex. Uh, and so again, like the strategy will just be to, to do surgery to, to fix the boundary components of the boundary tori one at a time, make the foliation meet them nicely, and uh, as long as the genus, as long as like I somehow have enough product disks floating around, I will be able to actually fix them all simultaneously. Uh, and so again, here the um, it's not just n minus two dimensional subcomplex. It's it's more than that. Uh, I know that my surface S is in fact m minimum genus, and it's uh, the cone, the open cone that it's contained in. Like I'll throw all of the vertices of this ball into this exceptional set E and my surface will be contained in like the cone on some face of my unit norm ball, which I've assumed is non-degenerate. And this will actually be a minimum genus in that face. Okay, and I guess I, I should clarify, like I'm saying genus, and I really mean genus as opposed to norm. That's sort of like an important thing that I don't know how to deal with. Anyway, so I hope you thought that was interesting. Um, this is a theorem about links, mostly in S3. I did get into like other free manifolds there briefly, blah, blah, blah. Um, I did some examples, so maybe that's okay. And thank you for asking me to talk. Okay, I will kind of let me stop. I know maybe.